Do... Do you suppose we'll meet any wild animals? Mm, we might. Animals that... that eat... straw? Uh, some, but mostly lions and tigers and bears. Lions? And tigers? And bears. <laughs> lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Lions, lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. 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 Meet a lion, and I mean, kind of a lion. I mean, he's not a very ferocious lion, but they don't know that. But it's a wilderness nonetheless. And you know, when we think about it, it could be quite a good metaphor for our spiritual journeys. When we become a Christian, you know, we think there's this yellow brick road. We read the Bible and follow God. How, how hard could that be? But there's a lot of things in between before we can get to the land of Oz. And for um, for for Dorothy, when she gets there, she finds out that she had the power to get home with her all the time. And that's with us. Well, we have the Holy Spirit in us. We have his power with us all the time. But often those wilderness journeys help us to learn that, help us to rely on him. As believers, we go, all go through at least one and probably more wilderness journeys. As a new believer, my faith was stretched almost immediately. I, I accepted the Lord in like October of 1980. And, it wasn't, and I just ate it up. I mean, I started reading the Bible every day. I wanted, you know, when I found out that God had a plan for my life, I wanted to know what it was. So I started reading his Bible every single day. I read through the whole Bible. It didn't take me a year. I don't remember how long. I, I quit watching soap operas so I could read God's word which is probably a lot better choice anyway. But I, you know, I was sitting there and I, I kept growing and I was at church every time the doors open, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And we, I was here all the time. And I, you know, I became best friends with a pastor and his wife and their kids and, and my daughter. And they, they, you know, we just had a great time and building fellowship and family. But then in 1982, just you know, a year and a half later, my daughter died in June and boy, did that rock your world. It changes everything. And, you know, I went through that time of darkness. I went through that time of trying to figure things out. I went through that time of, you know, God, why did you let this happen? But, you know, I knew he was there all the time. I knew he was with me all the time. And I knew she was with him now. And, you know, I was a single mom and I was, I hate to say it, but I was living, you know, I was living off welfare. Not that that's anything to be ashamed of. I was being able to be a stay at home mom that way. And so that was what I was doing. So the, within the week, I had to go out and look for a job. I mean, all of a sudden, I, my whole life changed. It wasn't just, I lost my daughter, but then I had to find a job. I had to get money for gas. I had to get money for food. I had to get, you know, life went on and I had to keep working. God was with me through all those challenges, the challenges of loss, of loneliness, of doubting his love. He gave me an awesome church family that was so supportive, and they were with me and helped me. My own family was very supportive as well. I mean, that's what God did. The Lord brought me through, and he helped me to have a deeper sense of compassion and empathy for those that are suffering. He brought me to a deeper sense of his presence. And I knew I was never alone, even when I was home alone. I knew that he was with me, even when it was empty and quiet and there was no more laughter. 
No more running around the house. But I knew he was with me. My deepest need became a gift. It drove me to depend on God. Often a wilderness journey will happen after those mountaintop experiences. Uh, the kid, when we go to camp, you know, you go and you take, you, I, I go with the youth group and with the kids camp. And when you go, the kids are going to camp and they, they make decisions for God. And they say, yeah, we're going to go home and we're going to live for God and we're going to do all this. And you know what? I do the same thing. I get caught up in it and there's nothing wrong with that. Those are all good things. But often when you get home, at least for me, I'm exhausted. I mean, we're up till 11 or midnight every night, and we get up at 8 every morning, and you're sleeping in a strange bed, and you're busy all day long outdoors. And if you're not used to that, you're exhausted. So when I get home from youth camp, it's usually Friday or Saturday, and Sunday's still coming. So then I still have to get everything ready for Sunday. And boy, by Monday, I'm tired, (laughs) and I'm ready for bed. But that's when Satan, that's when those wilderness journeys start sometimes. That's when you get attacked. That's when things happen. Because you think, wow, everything is so good and I can coast for a while. But often those are the times when we dive into those low times in our lives. And this happened to Elijah. He was on a mountain, literally. He was on Mount Carmel. It was after three and a half years of drought. You can find this story in 1 Kings 18. I'm not going to read the whole thing because we're going to look at mostly first chapter 19. But he, Elijah was up there. He was on Mount Carmel. And he said, he was basically, it was going to be a contest. He said, Ahab, I want to have a contest between my God and all your gods. And the people said, oh, that's a cool idea. And when we find out who the real God is, we'll follow him. So they did. Ahab and Jezebel, Ahab got all the prophets of Baal up there. He got all the prophets of Asherah up there. And then they built two altars, one on his side and one on that side. And then the priests and the prophets and stuff of Baal, they beat themselves all day. They cried out to God all day because the challenge was whoever lit the fire, whichever God lit the fire by himself without help from us, he would be the God they would follow. And the priests took all day long. They, all day long, they hollered out. They cut themselves. They danced around. But their, their sacrifice just laid there on this pile of rocks and didn't do anything. Then Elijah, at the time of evening prayer, prayed to God after they got well. And then he had to make it more difficult to make sure nobody could have any doubt whatsoever. They, he laid the, the bull out there. He got the altar all dressed up. And then they poured water over it. And they soaked it good. So there was no way that could accidentally ignite. And then he prayed to God and he said, God, you know, prove it. Prove who you are. And God did. He lit it up. He burned the fire. He, I mean, he burned the cattle and he burned the, lifted, he burned the whole altar. And he lapped all the water out of the trench. And there was no doubt to those people that were watching that that was God. He was the one true God. And what was cool, and then after that, Elijah said, well, if that's true, go ahead and take out all those prophets. And that day, 850 prophets were killed because they were following Baal and Asher. And then, here comes, then Elijah prayed to God again, and God sent the rain. After three and a half years of drought, God sent the rain and replenished the land. Then Elijah gets going, and he gets, the next morning, he gets this note, or gets a message from Queen Jezebel. And she says, Elijah, by this time tomorrow, you will be as dead as all those other prophets. And Elijah was tired. Elijah was exhausted. And he took off running. He forgot all about God's power. He forgot all about what God had just did. And he got depressed, and he entered a time, he entered the wilderness. And I'd like you to follow along with me from 1 Kings 19, 3 through 12. It's not going to be on the screen. It's page 285 of your pew Bibles, if you want to follow along. It's just, Elijah is so real, and it is so fun to read about him. Um, Page 285. Starting on verse 3 of chapter 19. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. 
I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and then he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up, and he ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave, and he spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a whisper. So as we look at that, look at that first part. It says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he got there, he left his servant and he kept going. And he got under this broom tree and he said, Lord, take my life. I've had enough. I give up. I quit. I am tired. By the time he got to that broom tree, he was physically exhausted. He had that, it was kind of like that one more thing that broke the camels, that straw that broke the camels back. Have you been there? As parents, there are times with our teenagers, or even with toddlers too, sometimes it's a moment and you feel like, oh, I've had enough. I can't do this anymore. I'm tired. Don't make me, and then you fill in the blank. Don't make me say that. Don't make me do that. Or your boss. Maybe they're passive aggressive and they're narcissistic and demanding and you've just had it. You can't take it anymore. Or maybe it's that time when you're, <clears throat> you finally are getting your bills paid. You're getting on your feet. Then the car breaks down. Or the hot water heat goes out or name it, <laughs> something happens. And then all of a sudden you're right back, it seems like where you started from. It's that one more thing that just puts you over the edge. Or maybe you've made dinner for everyone and everybody ate it really good and they loved it, but they didn't, not a single person said thank you and they left, all, left you with all the dirty dishes. <laughs> well, obviously that had some, <laughs> we've been there. And we all feel like just one more thing pushes you over. And Elijah stood down, evil king Ahab, he stood down all these prophets, and he called down fire, and he destroyed, he destroyed the, the altar, and he asked God for rain. All those things happened. Yet it took one lady, the queen, all she had to do was say, You're, I'm going to take you out. And she fell, he fell apart. Elijah had experienced God's protection and provision. He, was, he had experienced huge success, and he let one sentence bring him crashing down. He was so crushed in his spirit that he wanted to die. I love what God did, though. He gave Elijah rest. He said, okay, you're tired. Take a nap. And then he fed him. The angel woke him up to eat. Then he went back to sleep. And then she fed, the angel fed him again. He didn't, he didn't, give, him a, didn't give him a sermon. He didn't say, you shouldn't be like that. He said, instead, it's like what the, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, and he makes me lie down. He restores my soul. God didn't rebuke Elijah. He gave him rest and food. He sent an angel. And then he sent him farther into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. You know, Elijah spent that time fasting and praying and, and leading all these people back to God but he was exhausted. For our faith to grow deeper and to be real, we need that wilderness time in our lives. David experienced these feelings as well, and he also knew that God was with him. In Psalm 34, 18, it says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. 
The Lord is close. He isn't far away. He is right there with us in our wilderness journeys. We don't always see him or feel his presence, but we can know he is there. Our deepest need becomes a gift when it drives us to depend upon God. When I think of those wilderness journeys, I often see that we have a picture or a thing in our, in our bedroom. It's Footprints in the Sand by Mary Stevenson. And it says, one night I dreamed I was walking along the beach with the Lord. Many scenes from my life flashed across the sky. You can go to the next slide. I think I forgot to put that one on there. Okay, <laughs> in each scene I noticed footprints in the sand. Sometimes there were two sets of footprints. Other times there was one set of footprints. This bothered me because I noticed that during the low periods of my life, when I was suffering from anguish, sorrow, or defeat, I saw only one set of footprints. So I said to the Lord, you promised me, Lord, that if I followed you, you would walk with me always. But I have noticed during the most trying times of my life that there has been only one set of footprints in the sand. Why, when I needed you most, have you not been there for me? The Lord replied, the times when you've seen only one set of footprints in the sand is when I carried you. Verses 11 and 12 read, Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks, but God wasn't in the wind. And then he sent an earthquake. God wasn't in the earthquake. He sent a fire, and he wasn't in the fire. But after the fire came a gentle whisper. Why did God whisper? He whispers because he is always close. He's right there. And the other part of a whisper, what happens when somebody whispers to you? Huh? Gets your attention. And you usually lean in, don't you? You need to hear them. You want to hear what they have to say. God is whispering. And he wanted him to listen, to want him to know he was right there. In Hebrews 13, 5, it says, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. In Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle as the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. In the New Testament, God worked a lot in the wilderness as well. The gospels start off in wild places. Jesus himself is born basically in the wild. They get to Bethlehem, there's no room. They get there and they, he ends up in a stable, pro, po, very possibly a cave where they kept animals on the outside of town. That's a pretty wild place to be born. And then John the Baptist came preparing the way in the wilderness. And after being baptized by John in the Jordan River, Jesus is led into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to be tempted by the devil. Jesus also withdrew to solitary places and he taught in wild places throughout the New Testament. He didn't always preach in the synagogue. He preached on the hillside. He preached on the, on the shore. He preached on the water sometimes. He preached in areas that weren't, you know, they weren't set up in chairs and didn't have a sound system and didn't get everybody together. He preached where the people were. It was kind of, it was in the wild places. And he didn't do it just for himself. He also took the disciples off to a solitary place in the mountains to pray. And he also went up to a mountaintop and was transfigured before them. John Maxwell in his leadership Bible wrote this I wrote an article, part of it's called The Law of Sacrifice. Quality leaders are prepared in the wilderness. And this article highlights and supports the idea that God uses the wilderness to equip and prepare quality leaders. And that he even used the wilderness to prepare his own son. Maxwell states, the Holy Spirit led Jesus out into the wilderness right after his baptism by John, reminding us that at least part of his preparation for ministry came from a wilderness experience. Does that sound familiar? Quality leaders can almost always point to a wilderness time in their lives as part of their leadership preparation. During this time, our motives become pure, our backbone gets stronger, and our calling gets clarified. The devil tempted Jesus for 40 days in the wilderness, a screening process to see if Jesus would give it up or if he would trust God to provide. 
for this happened when, and it was a time that happened to me, um, and I can point to it, and I can, I'll tell you about it right now. Um, when I was at Oak Hills, I was the assistant pastor, and I thought, I'm almost ready, I'm almost gonna be ordained, I've spent my two years here, I've done all the work, I've got all my studies done, I thought for sure I was gonna be ordained when the head of the District Board of Ministerial Development came to be with our, with our new pastor at Oak Hills. And that meeting did not turn out like I thought it was going to. That day I was asked to step down. That day I was told that basically if we were not prepared to move and to be a pastor elsewhere, I really wasn't needed at Oak Hills anymore. And in the Wesleyan Church, before you're ordained, if you're not at a church, you're not a pastor, and you're not you're not you don't you're not a certified pastor anymore. So that was really hard. I thought, okay. <laughs> um, they said I could stay and volunteer, and you know, do what I'd been doing for the last 20 years. And I and I knew God had called me into ministry by this time, and I just knew it. But Gary was pretty adamant, pretty opposed to moving. <laughs> so, and um, so we had to go through a time of that. First, I looked at the Nazarene church because we're very similar, and they have women ministers. But they still wouldn't ordain me. I have to go through a bunch more schooling. And I'm old. I don't want to do any more schooling. I mean, <laughs> I've done this, been there. And so that you know, wasn't going to be an option. So then I thought, well, I have to go to another Wesleyan church. Well, from Rochester, there isn't a lot of Wesleyan churches in the neighborhood. There's one in Zimbroda, which didn't need a second pastor. And there was one in Austin and one in Wasika. So they're getting farther away all the time. Um, so we went to Austin because our kids knew kids in their youth group because we'd been to camp together. So I thought, OK, we'll go. So in August of that year, I went to church with my girls. I think Gary was working, so he missed the first couple of Sundays. But we drove all the way over to Austin and went to church. And, we, and I felt really that I could be used there. And the pastor there stepped out and mentioned that he could use somebody. So that's what happened. I ended up being the youth leader for a while, then became the assistant pastor. And after the two years again in 2011, I was, we did become an ordained Wesleyan pastor, which enabled me to become here eventually. But you know, that was a hard time to be told after all that preparation and stuff that you gotta make a decision, you're probably not gonna be here. And I thought, oh wow. <laughs> and I have wonderful men around me and my family. They, didn't, they weren't like me and got just sad and cried. I don't know, some of you men probably already know what you did, would do. They got angry. I mean, Dan was fighting angry and Mike and Gary and I thought, okay, calm down guys. <laughs> but one lady at, at Oak Hills was just a blessing. She sent me a card. And in that card, she had the verses from Philippians 1. And those verses, um, if I can find them, read that, you know, that God wasn't through with me yet. It said, I thank my God, she wrote, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, verse 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And I hung on to that. As I prayed and I sought God's answers, he knew what he was doing. I just had to figure it out. I just had to follow. And that's how we got here. The wilderness is, is like an incubator for growth in relationships with God and others. We grow so much during those hard, hard times if we, tr if we choose to. I imagine a lot of you know what an incubator is, and some of you might not. But an incubator is an apparatus that Takes, takes eggs and basically keeps them warm till, until they hatch. I know in Connor's second grade class or first grade class, they, they had chickens. They, they put eggs in an incubator and then they had chickens. My grandma did that and I think my mom, I think we had an incubator at home because we raised chickens as well. And that's, you know, you're in this thing and you're warm and, and you're getting, you know, getting heated up. But the word also means an environment that promotes the growth or development of something. For, for many, for us, the wilderness is an incubator for spiritual growth, and it aids in growth in relationships between oneself and God. So as we now enter the Advent season, which means that for the next couple of weeks yet, Christians will celebrate the coming of the Messiah in the person of Jesus Christ. As you likely know, he didn't make his entrance into the world in a glorious fashion. His mother, 
Mary and Joseph were looking up for a place to rest after a long journey. The town of Bethlehem was so crowded because of the census and tax regulations that the only place left was a stable. Jesus was born in a barn, surrounded by animals, with all the sights and the sounds with that go with that environment. Yet it did not lessen the glory of his arrival. As St. Paul, Paul later wrote, he said, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, that first Christmas gift. The gift of God's only son given in unpleasant surroundings was the greatest gift of all. He didn't come as a hero, but as a baby. He wasn't born in a palace or a royal throne, but in a stable. He wasn't visited by the elite with a red carpet announcement, but by humble shepherds, the poorest and the least of all society. He is for all mankind. <laughs> we are each given a gift. We all need to be in an incubator to come as come get stronger in our faith as as we, get, as we grow with the Lord. Elijah was around a long time after his experience. It wasn't the end of his career. He did finish. He was also given a young man to train up named Elisha, who would be around to take over. He was also given help and encouragement. The writer in Hebrews put it this way in chapter three, seven to nine. So as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. He's saying, don't harden your hearts. When you get into that wilderness, those hard times, don't get bitter. Don't dig in your heels and say, you're not going any farther. Don't just don't argue with God about it. Don't go bitter and angry, because that's the easy way out. But instead, trust God. He will lead you through. He is with you. He knows what is best. Remember, the Spirit led Jesus, the Son of God, into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus was led there on purpose. It wasn't an accident. To become a believer, the person that God has created you to be and us to be, our faith has to be tested and tried. Without those times in the wilderness, our faith will be weak and superficial. When Jesus challenged his disciples to share what was going on and he was sharing them how hard it was going to get and, and how much more there was to go, in John 6, 63 to 66, we read, The Spirit gives life, Jesus said, and the flesh counts for nothing. Jesus said, the words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one would come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. When the truth seemed difficult, when following Jesus was more than a free lunch, the crowd turned away. They saw the sweat equity and decided they weren't ready for that. It was too hard. It wasn't what they expected. We miss the lessons learned. We miss the excitement of the journey. We miss the glorious ending if we don't continue to follow. As he fa the other day, well, last month, we went to a haunted house with the youth group. And about halfway through, we had kids that wanted to turn around. <laughs> this is too hard. We can't get out. We're scared. And they were all freaking out. 
And I thought, you don't want to turn around. I mean, for one thing, there's another group behind us. And it would be just as hard to find our way out backwards as it would be to go forward and finish. And so, and you wouldn't miss the ending. Because when you got to the end, there was free hot chocolate and free cookies. And then we were going to go and get some ice cream. So we didn't want to miss it. And we made it. Our faith journey is so much more important than a haunted house. Yet the same principles apply. If we set our feet in and stubbornly refuse to go on, we miss the great and wonderful promises of God. For the people of Israel, when they refused to enter the promised land, they got 40 more years in the wilderness of wandering around. Wouldn't that be, that's not the fun way to go. They could have went right in. Yet they put in their, they were too scared to go. What if Mary and Joseph had said, ah, we aren't going to go to Bethlehem. He can come find us if he wants to know how many people need my tax money. But they didn't do that. Or when they had to escape to Egypt, if Joseph would have said, no, I don't want to go that direction, that's too far, our Savior could have been killed that night with the other two-year-old boys and younger. Satan would have won the day. When we refuse the lesson in the wilderness, often they'll be repeated. God doesn't, you know, he sometimes will turn around and go back and it, that journey will still be there. He'll just make, he'll, it'll just be waiting for us when we get to that point again. Or, you know, and he'll continue to reach out to us and he'll continue to want us to do it. God loves us too much to allow us to remain the same once we've accepted him as our savior. Yet if we dig in our hills and refuse to venture forward, we could end up lost and, and never find Oz, never find our way home to heaven. There are those here in church today that might be on a wilderness journey. You might be just at the beginnings, just feeling a little bit of that pain or wondering what God is doing. You might be in the middle of it and thinking, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm not coming back. Or you could be near the end. Hang in there. How are you doing? Are you leaning on God? Are you learning from him? Are you leaning in to hear his whisper? Isaiah wrote, see, I am doing a new thing and now it springs up. Do you perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. God is making a way for us. He won't take us out of it, but he will be with us through it. He will be with us all the way. We just need to complete the journey. Let's pray. And then we'll have communion. So, dear Lord, we just come before you. Wilderness journeys are, by just what they're called, are not anything any of us would wish on anybody else. But, Father, you know where we are today. You know where each one here is today. You know where their hearts are. You know where their faith is. And Lord, you have promised that you will never leave them or forsake them, that you are with us always. And Lord, even if we're in the middle of that wilderness and feel like you are so far away, you are right there with us. Lord, help us to remember that those are the times that you're carrying us. Those are the times that you are just helping us through and helping us to grow. Help us to become more and more like you.